بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم وبه نستعين What's the ruling on normalization treaties with the occupiers in Palestine? First of all, there's no doubt that Muslims can engage in treaties with the kuffar. They're generally referred to as a hudna in the books of fiqh or musalama or muwada'a or mu'ahada or musalaha. And what they are is truces with the kuffar and even the kuffar from Dar al-Harb. That's not an issue here. There's conditions, certain situations and stipulations that must be met. When those conditions are fulfilled, it's permissible for the Imam of the Muslimin who seeks the benefit of the Muslimin to have a hudna with the kuffar. The ulama spoke about this matter in depth in the books of fiqh. Some even related an ijma on the permissibility of a hudna with the kuffar. Of course, with the stipulations and conditions. However, an ijma' might not be so accurate because of Zahiri and Ibn Hazm stated that a hudna with the kuffar is not permissible because it's abrogated. It's abrogated by what? They said it's abrogated by the verse of the sword or the sword verse. What verse is that? فَإِذَا سَلَخَ الْأَشْهُرُ الْحُرُمُ فَقْتُلُوا الْمُشْرِكِينَ حَيْثُ وَجَدْتُمُوهُمْ وَخُذُوهُمْ وَحْصُرُوهُمْ وَقْعُدُوا لَهُمْ كُلَّ مَرْصَدٍ So they said it was abrogated. However, the overwhelming majority of the ulama stated that a hudna with the kuffar is permissible. As I said, to the extent that some related an ijma' on its permissibility. The term normalization itself, that's a term used for the so-called peace treaties with the Yahud. It's a term used to manipulate the terminology in order to deceive the Ummah to cover up the crime in danger behind what they're doing. Just like they called alcohol spirits, they called riba interest, they called shirk democracy, they called shirk nearness to the awliya. They do that to get them accepted in society and to manipulate the masses and to diminish the magnitude of their hurma. But that never changes the ruling on them. Al-hukbu yaduru ma'al haqiqa la ma'al lafz. The reality of normalization is similar to that of interfaith. Simply put, it's the outmost, deepest wala to the kuffar. Just like interfaith, it's aimed at demolishing one of the most unique traits of this ummah. The trait that's become nearly forgotten by the ummah due to the heavy dosages of anesthesia that's been injected in the ummah by the tawaghit and the shuyukh. The trait of wala and bara. The purpose of normalization is not a simple truce from fighting. Its purpose and goal is to Judaize the minds of the Muslims. It's to snatch bara'a of the Yahud specifically and kuffar in general from the hearts of the Muslims and to raise a generation with an identity crisis, a generation confused in their aqidah and in their tawheed. The invasion into the aqidah of the ummah is more dangerous than any land invasion. Anyone who attempts to give a ruling on these current treaties, the ones they call normalization with the Yahud, with the occupiers, they need to understand its reality and its effect, no matter what it's called. The ruling revolves around the reality of the matter not on the terms chosen by the traitors and hypocrites or anyone else. Knowing the treaties that the Messenger وسلم, had with the kuffar, that's the easy part. Memorizing them is easy. 
knowing their details and memorizing the isnad, that's easy. That's the easy part. That doesn't make one a faqih who can apply that knowledge onto current surrenderous treaties. One must understand the reality of the matter and its outcome in order to properly apply the ruling. Given a ruling on a matter is a branch of understanding its reality. You must have a comprehensive understanding of the reality of the matter, how it plays out, its effect, before you can judge it. Why? So that the ruling you give, the judgment that you give, is consistent with the reality. Some shiuch who allow normalization with the uh, Yahud, who allow wala to the Yahud, that's what it's really supposed to be called. If a woman was to approach them and ask them about a simple personal matter pertaining to her bleeding outside the menstrual days, they would interrogate her. They would ask her what color it is and what are its characteristics. They would inquire whether it happened before or not. But a dangerous issue that pertains to the destiny in fate, in future of the Muslims, many foolishly and ignorantly spit out a ruling on it faster than a spit comes out of their mouths. Some do it recklessly out of ignorance and foolishness, and that's a catastrophe. And then there are those who do it out of nifaq and to please the tawaqit, and that catastrophe is even worse. The reality of normalization between Arabic countries or Arabic leaders in the Yahud, the occupying Yahud, the one that's going on today, that's a violation on the aqidah level. It's not even on the fiqh level. It's aimed at dismantling the layers of la ilaha illallah in the hearts of the ummah. You don't even need to go to the details of the fiqh of hudna to get the hukum on this matter. It's at the aqidah level. The treaties with the Yahud today, what they call normalization, is muadda and wala to the Yahud. It's muzahara and muawana to an occupying enemy over the Muslims. Ya ayyuha alladhina amanu, la tattakhidhu al-Yahud wa al-Nasara awliya, ba'duhum awliya u ba'd, wa mayyata wallahum minkum fa innahu minhum. It's not a shara'i hudna in any way. It's to plant a radical change in the minds of the Muslims towards normalizing the sovereignty of what they call the state of Israel. And it's to be loyal them. It's recognizing the right of the occupiers to occupy Muslim lands over Muslim bodies, over Muslim captives. Countries who normalize will never teach properly teach that the Yahud are the strongest in their enmity to the believers. The proper meanings of that verse and its likes will be taken out of the curriculums and they must exert all their effort into trying to take it out of the hearts and minds of their citizens. The proper meaning of it. Countries who were on their way to normalization, like in Bilad al Haramain, were showing their good intentions to their masters by arresting anyone who, who merely spoke against normalization. Countries who normalize with the Yahud must change their curriculums and manipulate and revise the meanings of the Quran and the Sunnah. It aims to remove hostility and hatred against the Yahud specifically and the Kuffar in general. They want it removed from the belief in hearts and minds of the Ummah. Verses like, وَبَدَا بَيْنَنَا وَبَيْنَكُمُ الْعَدَاوَةُ وَالْبَغْضَاءُ أَبَدًا حَتَّى تُؤْمِنُوا بِاللَّهِ وَحْدًا Verses like that must be tailored to suit the Yahudi American interpretation. Normalization is to create a generation who fights the Aqidah from within. 
It's changing the lessons of the seer and history and the current events. It's to monitor the khutab in durus, in the masajid, to coincide with what pleases the Yahud in the United States. Wala and bara, for example, was taken out of some school curriculums. We spoke about that in the past. The correct teachings of wala and bara, as it's revealed by Allah, and as the Salaf knew it, can't be taught in the masajid of countries that normalize with the Yahud. They hide or distort principles of aqidah and they change the Salaf's meanings of ayat and ahadith to support this surrenderous move. Normalization is not returning matters to their normal state. It's to normalize what should never be normal in our deen. It's to denormalize what should be normal in our deen under the propaganda and disguise of fundamentalism, terrorism, and extremism. The, the Tawaghit have always had a hudna with the enemy, with the occupiers. But the normalization that's going on comes to take matters a step further. It's to plant in the hearts muwala to the Yahud. It's an aim to get the ummah to permanently dismiss jihad and to incline the masses to this dunya and to forget the bright history and izzah this ummah once had when they lived under the shade of the sharia of Allah. It's a treaty with the kuffar that, had, that has aqidah concessions. Concessions in the principles of this deen. That's not permissible in a treaty of hudna. That's being surrenderous. And it's abandoning the sharia of Allah. Comparing that normalization treaty that goes on, the ones that go on today, to the ones that the Messenger وسلم, had with the Yahud or Quraysh, that will Iyadu Billah is attributing to the Messenger وسلم, what he vigorously resisted in his weakest times and what he fought the world for in the strongest of his times. Never did our beloved Muhammad وسلم, compromise on the principles of the deen during his weakness, let alone during his strength. It's kufr to allege that the Messenger وسلم, compromised on the principles of the deen and it only gets worse when they do qiyas based on that kufr. Establishing economic, political, and cultural, and tourism ties, that strengthens the enemy. That strengthens the occupiers so they can step up their oppression towards our brothers and sisters and children in Palestine. It strengthens the Yahud to commit more genocides and to bring in more settlers and to build them more settlements. And it strengthens them in imprisoning Muslims and killing them over there. Most important of all that for them is the security ties, sharing intelligence. Normalizing countries share intelligence. They have to. The enemy they share intelligence against is the Muslim Muwahid who wants to uphold Tawheed and the friend is the Yahudi occupier. Wala goes to the enemy and Bara'a goes to the Muslim Muwahid Mujahid. Their treaties that aid the Yahud against Muslims in general, but specifically Muslims who want to liberate Muslim holy lands and live under the Sharia of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Ma'adhallah would the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam would ever agree to anything like that. Among the most basic terms that they have is to agree to recognize Israel's right to exist as a sovereign state on lands that Umar radiallahu an walked from Medina to Asham to liberate. It's to cede lands the companion Abu Ubaidah radiallahu an and his friends poured their precious sweat and blood on to liberate. Those treaties 
give the Yahud full control and right over lands liberated by the Sahaba and it gives them full right over the necks of the Muslims living under their control. Each life of the millions of lives the normalizing countries put under Yahudi control and put at risk is more precious, more significant than if the world were to be destroyed. The few millimeters they give the Muslims must be governed by anything but the Sharia of Allah. It must have leaders approved and appointed by them who do the dirty work for them. Leaders who give them their full wala, share the intelligence and cooperate with them against the Muslimin. Some, like the Tawaghit in Bilad al Haramain, and even the leaders of Gaza, they talk about agreeing to a treaty with the 1967 borders. And they speak about agreeing to that as if they're the Salah al Din liberators of our time. Agreeing to that 1967 borders is like someone coming to your mansion or your house taking your house and telling you, hey, there's two feet over there in the corner by the fence, go live over there. Or someone stealing your loaf of bread and giving you a couple of crumbs to eat. And, and, and a side issue, when Muslims in Gaza are being actively massacred, it's from the basic rules of wala and bara that every Muslim must give their full wala to the Muslim women, men, and children there. The focus must be that. Just as every Muslim must do when there's Muslims oppressed anywhere. We devoted, alhamdulillah, Rabbil Alameen, many talks to that situation, the situation in Gaza. But just because we defend the Muslims in Gaza during that genocide, while they're facing the most hostile people to the believers, not mentioning the reality of the leaders in Gaza is not an indication that we approve of them or that they're righteous. Every situation has a different discussion. The leaders of Gaza, like Ismail Haniya and his peers, they're filthy tawaghit. They're drenched in the slime of democracy, in nationalism, in love of the rawafid, in the killing and imprisonment of the pure muwahideen and the demolition of their masajid, among many, many other issues. And I spoke about it and I've been speaking about it for over 15 years, if not more. Agreeing to sign a treaty with the 1967 borders doesn't make one a hero. No one has the authority to give away lands Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala described as blessed lands. It has the Masjid al-Aqsa. It's our first qibla. It's the masra of our messenger sallallahu alayhi wasallam, Umar radiallahu anhu conquered it. Salah al-Din liberated it. There's a difference between the Muslims being weak and not able, not being able to liberate the lands and between giving them title and right and legitimacy and control over the lands in Palestine. It's an invalid, incorrect analogy or qiyas to compare those surrenderous treaties to the treaties of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam on a fiqh level. It's qiyasun ma'al fariq. There's no valid illa in this matter to conduct qiyas. When the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wasallam went to Medina and had treaties and agreements with some Jewish tribes, for example, they were not occupiers of Muslim liberated lands. They didn't forcefully take lands. Some were part of the community of Medina from, when, from before the, uh, the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam migrated there. He let them stay as they were. They were allowed to maintain what they had. They weren't evacuated or expelled until they betrayed the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Some treaties were made during offensive jihad. Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was going to Quraysh and the Yahud in their lands, imposing treaties on them in their territories. That's qital al-talab, jihad al-talab. In, in Palestine, it's jihad al dafa Each has its distinct rulings. 
The Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam never had a treaty with a combatant enemy who was actively killing Muslims on a day-to-day -day basis uh, in a back-to-back -back genocide with daily demolition of Muslim houses and farms and daily apprehension of children, women, and men. Has any treaty of the treaties you see today stopped any of that or lessened any of that? The treaties of the Tawagheet today have only increased the aggression of the Yahudi occupiers. Some get so desperate they compare agreements and rules of the Mu'ahideen. The Mu'ahideen are peaceful Jews and Christians who live under Muslim rule. They compare those to hostile combatant kuffar who are actively killing Muslims. More important than that is the violation of the aqidah in these treaties. In all the treaties that the Messenger Sallallahu had, whether it was with the Yahud or Quraysh or Kuffar in general, none of them ever dared nor ever thought about merely suggest suggesting, let alone forcefully imposing changes on Muslims in aspects of their aqidah in their own lands. Don't use that the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam agreed to uh, take out from the writing Ar-Rahman Ar-Rahim in Sulh Al-Hudaybiyah or Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in that same treaty or that he allegedly surrendered a Sahabi. I debunked that all in detail in Sulh Al-Hudaybiyah series. In every surrenderous concession they make to the enemies, they consistently bring up Sulh Al-Hudaybiyah or aspects of it as proof to justify what they're doing. And that's why we had a series refuting their claims. And it's Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen now, a book. It's Sulh al Hudaybiyah, Falsehood versus Facts. And I refer everyone to listen to those lectures or read that book. I don't need to repeat what I stated there. Even though it wasn't talking about uh, normalization treaties specifically, the answer to this question can be found there in detail. Bring one proof that the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam or the Khulafa al Rashidin entered in any treaty with the Kuffar who forcefully occupied Muslim lands where they agreed to cede or relinquish Islamic lands that were liberated or they agreed to accept a few millimeters that will not be governed by the Sharia of Allah with combatant enemies who are actively killing and imprisoning and oppressing Muslims and ordering them to change their aqidah in their own lands. Show me one example where any of the Messenger وسلم, or any of the Khulafa had a treaty of that nature. And let me, now let me make a point for the Juhal. Let's assume for the sake of argument and only for the sake of argument that all those normalization treaties that are going on and that are on the way, let's assume they're valid because they're all treaties that are similar to the treaties of the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Billah. Assume that for the sake of argument. What did the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam do when there was any type of hostility on Muslims from those he had treaties with? What did the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam do when the Yahud or Quraysh merely attempted to betray him? When a woman was violated, one. When a person was killed, when it was rumored that a person might have been killed. When it was rumored that they killed Uthman radiallahu an in the midst of the negotiations in Sulh al-Hudaybiyah, he was just one man, not a genocide. Without preparation and barely any weapons, Sulh al-Hudaybiyah was going to be dismissed and it was war until the death of every last one of them. One Sahabi, one man, not a continuous ongoing genocide and imprisonment of men and women and children who are besieged and raped and starved. Ka'ab ibn Asad from Bani Quraidha, from the Yahud. He had a treaty with the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. They didn't commit a genocide. They didn't imprison Muslims. They didn't rape and level towns and houses down. Ka'ab ibn Asad agreed to help the coalition, the Hazab, for merely agreeing to do that and intending on doing that. It was a breach of the treaty, the agreement, 
and it was a declaration of war. The Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam affirmed the famous judgment of Sa'ad ibn Mu'adh radiallahu an, and he rendered that tribe into history. It was a declaration of war and a breach of the treaty when Bani Nadir attempted to assassinate the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. When the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam merely heard that Bani Mustalaq were gathering to fight him, the treaty was over and it was a declaration of war. Bani Qaynuqa, they had a treaty with the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. But when a woman was dishonored and a man was killed defending her, it was a declaration of war. How many hundreds of thousands of women and men and children have the Yahud dishonored and killed and, and imprisoned? Don't ever think that the opponents of the Messenger وسلم, were weak tribes. Some of them had shielded forts. They had strong fighters, and some of them manufactured weapons. But the Messenger وسلم, didn't take any of that into account when Muslims were violated. With Quraysh in Mecca, the, the treaty, Sulh al Hudaybiyah, why did the Messenger وسلم, declare war on Quraysh and head to Mecca with 10,000 men? Radiallahu anhu majma'in. Quraysh violated the terms of the treaty by helping a tribe fight a tribe that was in alliance with the Messenger وسلم, A tribe called Bani Khuza'a entered into an alliance with the Messenger وسلم, Bani Bakr entered into alliance with Quraysh. Those two tribes fought each other. Quraysh helped Bani Bakr. The Messenger وسلم, considered that a breach of the treaty and a declaration of war. My point is, those who use the treaties of the Messenger وسلم, to support their betrayal of the Ummah, okay, now follow along and do what the Messenger did when a single woman was violated, when a single man was killed, when there was an attempt or intent on betrayal. We can discuss other side issues that they bring up that are irrelevant. They're irrelevant because the current normalization treaties are a violation on the Aqidah level. For example, they allege briefly, we'll take it briefly, they allege, for example, that these treaties are for the Maslaha and benefit of the Muslims. I mentioned when I spoke about Sulh al Hudaybiyah in detail, I mentioned in detail the great achievements and accomplishments and the strength that the Muslims gained in that temporary truce during Sulh al Hudaybiyah. Islam spread in the Arabian Peninsula. They strengthened their military and economic and political power, and they took time away from fighting Quraysh to crush other enemies. These current normalization treaties weaken the Muslims and they only strengthen the Yahud. These are treaties that not only can't stop genocides, but they can't and don't save a single life from the aggression of the Yahud. Rather, they aid the occupier in this hostility. These treaties can't release a single underage prisoner, let alone a male or an adult, from the thousands of prisoners that the Yahud have. The treaties impose a deviant aqidah on the Muslim masses in their own lands and territories. These treaties can't halt nor even pull out a nail, a single nail from a single wall, from the hundreds of settlements that are being structured there. There's absolutely nothing but harm to the Muslims in these treaties with the Yahud. Its only benefit is for the Yahud and to cement the throne of the Tawagit. 
other fiqh issues is the issue, for example, uh, that the majority of the fuqaha spoke about, with the exception of the Hanafiya, that they said the hudna is only permissible if it's conducted by the imam or his representative. And an another issue that's discussed by many, it's whether the hudna uh, or the treaties with the kuffar, are they valid if they're permanent? In, in First of all, and this is an issue discussed by many of uh, Talabat al-Ilm. Number one, there's never, there can never be a permanent treaty with the kuffar because it cancels out jihad and because of the verse, فَلَا تَهِنُوا وَتَدْعُوا إِلَى السَّلْمِ وَأَنْتُمُ الْأَعْلَوْنَ وَاللَّهُ مَعَكُمْ وَلَيْ يَتِرَكُمْ أَعْمَالَكُمْ However, what confuses many in this matter is a dispute in this matter. In the minority opinion, is what I believe is the correct one. The issue is, is it permissible to have treaties with the kuffar without specifying a deadline? The minority opinion is yes. If, of course, it's a proper shari'i treaty that fulfills the shari'i conditions. Proof clearly supports that. Meaning, it's permissible to have a treaty with the kuffar that is mutlaqa or mu'akkata. Mutlaqa means there's no specified deadline in the treaty. It doesn't stay for 10 years or for four months. Just an open-ended agreement that we're not going to fight. That's totally different than saying it's forever or agreeing to have it forever, which is not permissible. Mu'akkata means there's a specified set time in the contract. And the ulama who required a set time in the uh, hudna, they disputed how long it can be. And it's not the time right now to discuss that. If it's mutlaqa, mutlaqa we said is with an unspecified deadline. If it doesn't have a deadline, it can't be lazima to ta'bid, meaning it can't be forever. Yes, the treaty, may not mention 10 years or four months or five years, it's open-ended, but that doesn't mean it's forever. It can't be forever. When Muslims get stronger and it's a benefit for the Muslims, they inform the enemy, this treaty has come to an end. I wanna reiterate, al-mutlaq in treaties with the kuffar is not considered forever. It's just not mentioning a specific ending date in the treaty itself. The mutlaq is aqdun jaiz, aw ghair lazim, meaning one or both of the parties have the right to terminate the contract without the consent of the other. That's very similar to other uqud that are jaiza, like uh, power of attorney or contracts of wills and gifts. You write someone an open-ended power of attorney to handle some of your affairs. There's no specified ending date or expiration date on it. Once you change your mind about that, you no longer want it, you let him know that this contract is over. Another point that some make is the demoralizing argument that Muslims are weak. Those who demoralize the masses alleging that Muslims are weak today had they lived during the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam's time, they would have deterred the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam from every single battle or expedition that he led or ordered. Materialistically speaking, when were the Muslims more powerful than the enemy? When did the Muslims outnumber, outpower the enemy? They would have deterred those who make this kind of argument they would have deterred Abu Bakr as-Siddiq from fighting the Murtaddin. And they would have deterred him and swayed him from all the conquests he had after that. They would have deterred Umar and Abu Ubaidah and Sa'd ibn Abi Waqqas and Khalid ibn al-Walid from nearly every battle because in nearly every one of them they were outnumbered, outpowered. There would have been no battles with the Romans and Persians. The Muslims are not weak, but there are tawaghit and their shiuch who like to instill 
this defeatist mentality in the Ummah, as I mentioned in previous talks. The most important thing to know is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala based victory and given him victory. He made given him victory, Jalla fi ula, the foundation and the condition and the base for victory. Ya ayyuhal ladheena amanu in tansuru Allah yansurkum wa yuthabbit aqdamakum. Materialistic force was in a condition in that verse. Muslims don't take pure materialistic matters into account alone. Especially, especially when it's jihad al dafa They rely on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, gather what they have and set off towards the enemy as the messenger sallallahu alayhi wa did. It should not be understood that Muslims fully ignore materialistic preparation, but it's not everything. When there's obedience, to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Yaqeen. In proper tawakkul on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Muslims gather what they can and what they have and they proceed. Even if it's stones versus airplanes. Wa'addu lahum mastata'atum min quwa. Gather against them what you can of what you can of power. Material preparation is not ignored. But what's requested is just what you have. You don't say, let's wait another 60 years until we have nuclear weapons while they're raping our sisters and killing our children. Muslims have enough capabilities to lead the globe as they previously did. But when the defeatist mentality is taught in the masajid and it's instilled in the hearts and minds, it paralyzes the limbs. When that happens, there's no worldly power on the face of the earth that can get a person to stand up, let alone win, no matter how mighty it is. And that combined with the lack of iman and yaqeen and tawakkul. Normalization is to propagate a defeatist mentality among the Muslims. Normalization is to normalize Muslims being weak. It's to normalize that they will be oppressed and that they will live under foreign occupation and under the direction and order and command of the Yahud in the United States. There's no share of victory that will be attained so long as people or Muslims take into con consideration materialistic means only. Cut off from the aid of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. There's a lot of details that I can add on this issue as it pertains to the fiqh matters that are brought up, but they're not needed. What's needed to know is that normalization treaties are void and prohibited. The ones that are going on today, they're void and prohibited because they're compromising on the principles of the deen of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. One must fully know and understand their details and their reality and their effects before giving a ruling on them. There's an old fatwa by Sheikh al-Allama, al-Imam Nasr al-Fahd, Fakkallahu bil-Izzi asra, on this matter. It's better than anything I can say on this matter.